The Witcher Old World appeared on Kickstarter in 2021, proclaiming, Toss a coin to your Witcher, a valley of plenty. And thanks in part to the license donated by one of the biggest names in video games, CD Projekt Red, the communicative project managers who supported every backer's quest for additional content, and of course, the chorus of YouTube Kickstarter hypesters. people did. And this game raised just shy of 7 million euro. And just because I'm curious, I want to see just how many coins that comes out to. Okay, so The Witcher Old World, I've got the Kickstarter up here now, it actually raised 6,840,648 euro. Let's convert that to US dollars. Google! That comes out to $7,683,703.14. <laughs> okay, that's a lot. How many pennies is that? Let's say everybody in the tavern just has pennies. Oh, wow, okay, that's a ton. So if there was a witcher who performed and made this much money and everybody just had pennies, he would have 768,370,314 pennies thrown at him. <laughs> hmm, what a lovely day. Hmm. This guy would be so deceased and the tavern would probably collapse under the weight of all that metal. The Witcher Old World was forged in the lifeblood of a million wallets and probably should be like gold plated or something. And well, it's not, but it is really nice. Uh, the miniatures are very detailed and finely sculpted. They got these very dynamic looks to them. The cards are all cut from a species of cardstock so beefy that they might be distantly related to Henry Cavill. And the dice have these fun little Roman numerals on them with witchy symbols. Ooh. And then you play the game and you realize that the five and six on the dice look basically the same and there are more typos in this box than you would think you would find in a game with a multi-million dollar budget. And you start to get this weird feeling like you've purchased a house and found mold in the shower. In a game of The Witcher Old World, all players compete to obtain trophies through either defeating monsters or other witchers or through developing their personal skills. The instant a player earns their fourth trophy, the game is over and that player is crowned the winner. On your turn, you will discard cards from your hand to move yourself around this map, triggering different location actions as you go. You might head over to Loki Gear to, to, to fritter away your earnings in a game of Witcher Yahtzee before toddling over to Hirn Kadich to level up your combat in an on-the-job certification course. And then you might march on over to Kinder this place and get a potion before moving on to Kaidarnismus to level up your defense and then you go on to Kyrds whatever that place is and level up your alchemy. After you've decided that you've romped around enough or you've run out of cards in your hand, you can choose to explore your local area. One of your opponents will then read to you a card drawn from the proper deck and you'll be able to make a fun little choice about the scenario that you find there. After you've reaped the consequences of your decision, you'll be able to purchase a card from this row, adding that to your hand, and then your turn will be over. You can also choose to fight local monsters looking to battle in your area instead of exploring, and you'll want to do that a lot because that's how you win, and also because fighting is the most fun part of this whole game.
discourse about the Witcher video game franchise, which is really what this game is an adaptation of, is quick to praise its side quests. I've never played any of the Witcher video games, but it seems as though Geralt of Rivia's latest plight is never quite as engaging as the peasants in town and their constant struggle for survival in a land terrorized by monsters. This tangential content is so engaging that Sean Prescott, writing for PC Gamer, concluded that in The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, the game's distractions are where its most engaging stories are found. The board game tries to capture a similar RPG feel, and it succeeds, sort of. On a player's turn, they can decide to explore, and they can choose to wander around the city center, or delve into the wilds beyond the city walls, and that's pretty thematic and, and super fun. Then an opponent will draw the top card of either the city deck or the wilds deck and they'll reveal to the exploring player what they find. And that's where things can get a little iffy. You see, every scenario that you find has to be generic enough to fit every situation. So all of the NPCs you meet have no names and no particularly interesting characteristics. From the burly tavern keepers to the beer swilling dwarves, the slate of fantasy tropes you meet in this game have all the charisma of a bowl of oatmeal. Since whatever happens to those characters only affects how much money you make and whether you develop one attribute over another, those NPCs quickly become irritating bits of text that stand between you and your reward. Initially, these exploration cards will be amusing anecdotes to savor. So you're exploring the city. The tavern keeper greets you with a leer. What? A witcher? In my establishment? He says. We don't serve your kind here. Get out! You can choose to either leave or punch the tavern keeper in the face. Okay, you're gonna leave? You walk away, loneliness burning within you. When will you, a mutant, ever find a place to call home? Gain two gold. But after the game reaches its third hour and people at the table start to get restless, they will devolve into something like this. Okay, so here's a horse. It wants you to brush its teeth or comb its mane. Come its main? Okay, cool. Um, get two gold. Oh, okay, so there's another dwarf, and the dwarf is wanting to know if you will scratch his back or brush his toes. Okay, you'll brush his toes? Alright, so you'll level up your alchemy and get a potion. It turns out, without context or names or memorable characteristics, characters in scenarios become material for jokes at best and downright annoying at worst. And I really wanted this to work. My friends and I tried different things to make the exploration a little more engaging. We took all of the dwarves and we named them Krog and pretended like they were one dwarf. All the beggars became one beggar named Randy. And every time we drew a card and, and there was a beggar in the scenario, we'd be like, oh, there's Randy again. What's he, what does he want this time? So yes, the branching narratives aspect of the video game franchise is here, but it's sort of the LaCroix version of it. It's kind of the barest hint of flavor in this otherwise watery drink. Check this out. When you get hit, you are going to knock cards out of your deck. If you get to zero cards in your deck, you are knocked out. If you're able to knock all of the cards out of your opponent's deck first, you win. When a monster hits you, it's going to deal damage to you. When you hit a monster, you're going to take the cards in your hand and use them to connect a combo. Build a perfect combo and you'll be slashing that monster to ribbons. But you don't just fight monsters. You can fight other witchers too. And it's practically the same process. You just build combos and smack each other. But other players at the table can place wagers on the outcome of your fight and they can earn money based on how well you do. This is the e-ticket ride of the Witcher Old World and it takes forever to resolve, but for the players involved, whew, it is a great time. For a game this large and with this thick of a rule book, The Witcher is fairly easy to play. At no point does a person need to make a decision that involves more than two factors. The deck building is matching colors and there's only one type of currency and really only two ways to get it. The problem with the game is it's crushing length. And when I say this game is long, I do not mean 
fiddler on the roof long. I mean, a cure for insomnia. The first game I played of this lasted three hours. That was a two-player game, and my opponent was a board game enthusiast that had read the rulebook ahead of time. As a general rule, I love long board games. I own more of them than I can reasonably expect to play in the next two lifetimes. But when I play a long board game, I'm accustomed to entering a bizarre time compression zone where three hours can pass by in the blink of an eye. Oh, Chronicles of Empire and Exile, Warrior Knights. These are games where you can sit down to play them and a seeming 15 minutes later, you're like, wow, that was a great time. Why is it midnight and where did this beard come from? And The Witcher does a great job of bringing me into that zone, but it only keeps me there for the first hour and a half, after which every minute passes by with the speed and aimlessness of a banana rolling down a hill. As a serious board game analyst, I've distilled my findings into two graphs. In this first graph detailing other long games, you can see that as a game goes on longer, the more fun players have. That's because on this upward rise, players are coming up with engines to get resources more efficiently. They're cooking up plots to unseat one another. All of that culminates in a climactic moment that happens two or three hours into the experience, where everything comes down crashing around players ears in an episode of backstabbery that is climactic and cataclysmic. The game ends right after that, leaving everybody hungry for another round. When we look at The Witcher, we see that though the initial fun threshold is higher than it was for other long games, the amount of fun that a player is having remains static throughout the entire experience. And that is because you are doing in turn 10 exactly what you were doing in turn 1. At the beginning of the game, you will be making gold by playing poker and fighting monsters. And by the time you are on turn 11, three and a half hours later, you are still earning gold by playing poker and fighting monsters. And this endows the game with a sense of flatness, where long games feel like you're climbing a mountain of fun to reach a peak of your experience. The Witcher feels more like crossing a prairie. And just like crossing a prairie, if you decide to sprint across it instead of walk, you'll get to the other side faster, but you'll have a significantly less enjoyable time getting there. The length of the game is a flaw, in my opinion, but it is not unintentional. To mix my metaphors here, this game reminds me a bit of an elderly couple sitting on a porch swing in a rural town, perhaps somewhere in the American South, sipping their iced tea and reminding you that if you are thinking too much about your destination, you're missing the point of your journey. Abbreviating exploration encounters in the name of speed and cutting your way through combat encounters without taking time to imagine what might be going on takes this colorful experience and turns it into a grayscale slog. So it's a real catch-22. The game is too long for its own good, but the worst way to play it is quickly. And now that we've unpacked all of that, let's briefly talk versions and price. If you go to buy this game now, there will be two editions of it available, a standard edition and a deluxe edition. Everything that you've seen in this video is from the standard edition. And the deluxe edition has nothing in it that the standard does not have, except for 28 miniatures, which replace these cardboard tokens for the monsters. It adds nothing mechanical to the game and it provides like no further actual content. If you just want to experience what this game has to offer in terms of gameplay, the deluxe edition is absolutely unnecessary. Save yourself $100 and pick up the standard. And that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you got this far, I look forward to seeing you in the next one and go play a game or something. <laughs>And another thing, where are the female witchers? The perfect medieval hair. <laughs> right. It's 2023, people, come on. Okay, that's good. Yep, that'll do it. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of...
of plenty Also there are no female characters in this game Unless you buy an expansion I'll do one more